frames of video on membrane potential. Reinforce concept learned in fourth grade. The human brain alone contains about 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. A neuron, like every other cell, has positively and negatively charged ions inside and outside. Further, a resting neuron has a greater negative charge on the inside surface of the plasma membrane and a greater positive charge on the outside surface. This partitioning of charge creates a voltage difference across the membrane known as the resting membrane potential, which can be measured using a voltmeter. On average, an intracellular electrode records a value of minus 70 millivolts. The resting membrane potential depends on two factors. First, it depends on the presence of sodium and potassium gradients across the plasma membrane. Specifically, there are more sodium ions outside the neuron than inside, and more potassium ions inside the neuron than outside. Second, the resting membrane potential depends on the differential permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium and potassium ions. Leak channels in the plasma membrane allow sodium and potassium ions to diffuse or leak down their concentration gradients. The membrane contains many more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels. Thus, the membrane is much more permeable, or leaky, to potassium ions. As positively charged potassium ions leak out of the neuron, the inside surface of the membrane becomes negatively charged compared to the outside surface. If potassium was the only ion moving, the potential would stabilize at minus 90 millivolts. However, positively charged sodium ions leak into the neuron, which slightly offsets the negative charge and raises the voltmeter reading to minus 70 millivolts. Sodium potassium pumps actively transport sodium ions out of the neuron and potassium ions back in, compensating for the sodium and potassium leaks. Thus, the pumps help to maintain the resting membrane potential. Physiology. <clears throat> Step one, resting potential. We, we've talked about that. The resting potential is our is our rest state. So the rest is resting. And what was really important there are the leak channels. Channels that are always open and they just leak particular things, sodium, potassium, in or out. They're always open. Leak channels. A pore. A channel with a pore in it. So it's the leak channels with that pump. stimulate the cell, when you excite the cell, what are the other things? Excited, out of rest. We have all the, these other things that we talked about. Rated potentials, study that. So list these under when you excite the cell. Rated potentials. For there, think about the neuromuscular junction. And the, remember the ACHR? That was an example of a, a ligand-gated channel. 
or the ligand, the neuro neurotransmitter, allowed the channel to open and allowed sodium influx. Though that is the graded potential okay. caused by the ligand gated channels. On the slide, I say chemically gated channels, same thing. A ligand is a chemical. Thing is, these allow sodium influx. That influx is the excitement. However, I guess the question you could say, is that enough? Is it, is it enough to excite the cell? Is it enough? Put that in the form of a question. Because you need enough sodium influx to reach what's called threshold potential. <coughs> Threshold potential, I mean, did you reach it or not? Yeah, just the potential's there. Okay, what was, again, for the umpteenth time, what was resting membrane potential? What was the number? Minus negative 70 millivolts. You know, some, um, most books will list the threshold potential at something like negative 55. Is that more negative or more positive? Negative 55. It's more positive or less negative. Different way of saying the same thing. That, that's enough. If you can get the cell positive enough to where it measures that, what you're doing is um, there's enough of these ligand gated channels that opened up. You're jolting the cell at the dendrites, at the soma, and even at the axon hill. You're just jolting it. You're zapping it, trying to get enough to like make it fire down its area of output, the axon. Okay, and the, the enough would be um, that. So that's why we consider these little graded potentials that may allow you to reach the threshold potential to get the full nerve impulse signal, which is the axon potential number four. So number one, number two, so number three is threshold potential. Number three by there, just to follow the figure. And then if you reach threshold, yes, then you trigger an action potential, number four. Now the ash potential, the area of output, is the um, axon. So think axon when you think action potential. Now when you think graded potentials where you zap the cell to get it to fire, think those other locations. Dendrites, the soma, or the axon hillock. Those are the places where you can zap the cell to zap it to threshold to get it to fire or inhibit. Sometimes you want to inhibit cells. I'm using the example of stimulate or excite the cell. So I want to talk about the graded potentials next, a condition of excitement. So in this slide, um, they show the chemically gated channels here, the ligand gated. These are like at the neuro, neuromuscular junction. It binds some chemical and allows some sodium to influx. Here is the voltage gated channel. We talked about this before too. I'll, I'll save this for the axial potential where there's, there's a change in voltage. And look at these negative charges here. When they become positive charges because of a local depolarization, that change in voltage opens the gate. Okay, so don't confuse all these different channels I'm talking about. Lead channels for rest, the ligand gated for the graded potentials, and when we get to the action potential, we'll talk about voltage gated channels. Like that here. Voltage. So I'm 
just going to circle the three different channel types. This one for action potentials, this one for the graded, and this one for the rest. So just so you don't get them confused. So the graded potentials are, are how we excite the cell. And so here, here's a picture of it. You just synapse onto the cell at different locations. So the cell you're zapping, call it cosynaptic. But then call all the cells zapping on it in three locations the presynaptic. That red one it looks like it's let's see, do I have red? The red cell is zapping the so much. You guys see that in the picture? Let's see if you're with me here. Uh, the green cell on the picture, what is it synapsing onto? What part? Dendrites. And then, um, oh, I, I use blue. Jeez, I'm sorry. It's the green cell that's dendrites. Got ahead of myself. And it's the blue cell that's uh, synapsing onto the axon hillock. Causing greatest potentials. And yeah, that's what I'm trying to say here. <coughs> Here's a picture of what's going on at, at a close up view. Here's the synapse, the connection. The synapse is a connection between two cells. However, the cell membranes, there's a small gap in between it, and we call that the synaptic cleft, just like for the near muscular junction. So the only difference here in the near muscular junction when we talk about this, here's the axon terminal. What cell was this in the neuromuscular junction? A muscle fiber. I call this the motor end plate because it was a different cell. That's the only difference here. So I, I don't want to uh, reteach it, but let's do review what's happening here. And the action potential is coming down here. Okay. Calcium. Um, that triggers the voltage gated calcium channels to open. And calcium is the second messenger signal that allows all of these neurotransmitters to burst their neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. Let me write that down. Before I write it, let me see if you're with me here. Here's the synapse we're talking about. Is this cell the pre or post synaptic cell? Pre. This is pre, that's post. In case you were wondering, it says it right there. Right there. <laughs> what we see is that there's, um, when you release these vesicles, it's not a steady stream, like turning on a water faucet, you get a steady stream of water. They call it quantal burst, like they release in spurts. Okay, I'll call it a release neurotransmitters, quantal bursts. space between cells. Let's keep following that. So then I want you to see what happens at the uh, microscope level, the uh, ligand gated channels. NTs, neurotransmitters. 
I don't want to keep writing out neurotransmitters. So I'll just abbreviate it NTs. They bind the ligand gated channels. Shown there. You get sodium influx. That sodium influx is a, call it a very, you know, small or you know, teeny weeny depolarization. It's a very small influx. Sodium influx occurs. Causing a degraded potential. So the graded potential the greater potential is um, the sodium influx. Literally, sodium coming in through these ligand gated channels because of the neurotransmitter. But that's all it is. Okay. Now, I don't know if I like this picture too much. Uh, they show the ion coming in, they show the uh, reuptake of the enzyme. And when you measure them on a graph, these, these teeny weeny depolarizations, here are the properties of a graded potential that you should understand uh, when, you, when you try to stimulate a cell. Here, you've tried to stimulate it, but it, you failed. Okay, you didn't, you didn't reach threshold. So think of the threshold potential as being an on-off switch. You have to reach threshold to turn the cell on. In all other cases, you're off. Okay, what are the properties of these graded potentials? They call them graded because they can be small, medium, or large. They're, they're graded. They can be small or big or anywhere in between. They're graded. Here, what I see is um, a small depolarization. Here, a cell's at rest, and right here, you zap it. Here's our negative 70. They give you a negative 50 on there. They give you a zero up here. This is millivolts. So you're chugging along at rest, and then when you zap it, it kind of goes up and down, okay? And then you continue on at rest. So what happened is, you're at negative 70, then you get the sodium influx, sodium in, then let's say you're negative 60. Got a little blip right there, it says negative 60. But you didn't reach threshold, so you return to negative 70. You go boom, boom, then boom. That's essentially what you see there. You did not reach threshold. Okay, but that, that's a graded um, polarization. So the other thing we learn is, you zap a cell right here, you don't reach threshold, eventually it, it goes away. So, um, what's the word they use? Uh, they're decremental, that's the word they, they use. Decremental. They die fast. You may get a little bit of a blip for a little bit, but eventually it'll return to rest real quick. You didn't zap it hard enough to cause the cell to fall on the fire. Okay. Um, so, let's see. You don't travel very far.
So let's say you have this big, let me give you a two-dimensional picture of it. And it's like negative 70 everywhere from corner to corner. It's all negative 70. And then let's say you like take your little electrode and you like zap it right there, like bam, and put a positive charge right in there. And maybe you depolarize it, yeah, to like negative 60. And those negative charges, um, those positive charges that got in and depolarized it to negative 60, the positive charges look around and they say, wow, it's negative everywhere in this space. I'm going to travel in all directions, okay, all the way out. But it, they don't travel very far. So like maybe into, you get out to here and maybe it's negative 65 and you get out one more level and maybe it's negative 70. So they, they travel a certain distance in all directions. It's like throwing a, a pebble or a rock into a, a body of water that's very still and it creates ripples. And the ripples die out really quick. But if you use a bigger rock, it'll make bigger ripples, but they'll still eventually die out. That's kind of the analogy that they give here. So you could be um, in a state of t teeny weeny depolarization right there, but then right there, like I say on the slide, you repolarize back to rest. Here, they call this a hyperpolarization. Maybe you want to inhibit the cell from firing, which is desirable sometimes. So take it further away from threshold. Say 50 is threshold. On the previous slide, you went closer to threshold, so you increased the chance the cell could fire, but you didn't fire, but you at least increased the chance you could fire because you became closer to threshold. Here, um, keep going the wrong way, sorry. Here, you went further away from threshold, so you're decreasing the chance the cell will reach threshold. We call that inhibition, so let me draw that. Slide. Maybe you just go. Mm. Okay. So that will be a hyper polarization. Take the message. A small dipole. increases chance cell will fire. A small hyperpolarization decreases chance cell will fire. So a dipole or hyperpolarization, this is all under the category <clears throat> of a graded potential. These small little changes from rest, either a little bit higher or a little bit lower. Okay? And the goal is inhibit the cell by hyperpolarizing it or get enough of a depolarization stimulus to make it fire. There's a picture of um, what's going on. I tried to give you a picture here by kind of giving you a two-dimensional look. What, what they do is they show you the resting state by these ligand gated channels, negative 70, and that when you bind the neurotransmitter and you get the sodium influx, those positive um, cells get in. They, they color the membrane red, and they look around. And everywhere is negative. And what they do is here they travel in both directions. They call that local current flow because it's traveling along the uh, membrane there. And if you were to measure it, when you're close to the stimulus, it's negative 65, close to negative 60, but it quickly they die out. Further away from the point of stimulus, it's rest. So they don't travel very far. That's what they're trying to show you there. Here they physically stimulate the cell to show you you can depolarize a region. And uh, here they show you the influx, you know, traveling both directions along this telephone cable-like axon. They call it the spread of depolarization. And um, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll put this picture on the um, test. And what am I trying to show you there? 
Here's membrane potential, negative 70. That's rest. But you stimulate right there. And how high do you get? Okay, a certain amount of depolarization. But why does it drop off? It's because decremental, they die fast. So this is the example of a graded potential. They decay. Okay, so I think that picture does a good job uh, showing that. I'm going to stop here for today for lecture. Um, I got a couple of labs. We'll do ash potential on uh, Wednesday. On well, lecture exam three, we'll be on proctorial again. It'll cover the bone, the muscle, and the nervous chapters. That's chapter six, nine, and eleven. And I'm still writing it, but I, I intended to be um, something like. 60 to 80 multiple choice questions. So it'll be a little longer. And um, <coughs> no, no written. <coughs> I typically give something like two minutes per question. So depending on how long the test is, no, no, it'll be available Friday because it's on the schedule for Friday. But since it is Friday leading into the weekend, I'll make it available all through the weekend through Sunday. Any questions on that? Something like 60 to 80 questions. How much time will you give us for that? About two minutes per question. So if it's 60 questions, how long will it be? Yeah. I'm still writing it. Oh yeah, look at the schedule. That's for people call. So come to class. Yeah, the whole reason why I do that is so I can get ahead. Yeah, the labs that are due is the EMG lab. Did anyone need to finish that lab? Okay, I can pull that bad boy out. The rest of you, you need to turn it in. And the next lab that's due Wednesday, I have a worksheet at 15. I made a few copies if uh, you didn't print it out, although I hope you're starting to do that. Do you lab do today? Yeah. This nervous tissue.